Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you for being here as we kick off our MFA reading series. I'm just here as academic director, Beth Mead, to introduce our introducer, Professor Dave Mann. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll lower this back down for you when it's time. Okay, thank you, yes, I'm Dave Madden. I teach here in the MFA program. And it's my pleasure tonight to uh, introduce Vivian Gornick, our reader. Um, a reminder to silence your cell phones if you haven't done so yet. Um, and also, uh, you may have noticed or taken use of the bookstore table in the back where some of Vivian's books are there for, uh, for sale. She'll be sitting there for a bit after the reading to sign books if you'd like. Um, and thank you to the USF Bookstore for being here. Um, I'd like to thank, oh, <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank Micah Ballard, uh, Sherilyn Walker, and Hannah, oh, Ben Dex, oh, I'm sorry, Hannah, I forget your last name. It's wrong, Ben Dex, right. Um, for all of their help in setting this event up. I should have put these down on my notes instead of just taking notes. Um, tonight's reading is sponsored by the MFA program uh, with the English department here at USF with generous support from the Office of the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, and then please stick around after the reading. There'll be a brief Q&A with Vivian and a reception in the back. Um, and I need to tell you also that we have two other readings happening this semester. The uh, USF faculty reading will be happening Wednesday, October 25th. In just a few weeks, and then after that, we have the poet Paisley Rechtal coming on Tuesday, November 7th. I think they're both in this room. Probably, yes. But check on our website, and Twitter feed, etc., for that. Okay. So there are many things that I've learned from reading Vivian Gornick's essays and memoirs over the years, that the pleasures and art of memoir line, the story of what it's telling does to a person, the transformation that gradually occurs. I've learned how walking in a certain spirit through the places we call home can reintroduce that world to us in a shock of astonishment and new incomprehension. I've learned that having a mother who actually says what she's thinking is both a blessing and a curse. And I've learned so much about voice, about how the right, honest structuring of words on the page can evoke a persona so multivaried and alive that I feel an intimacy with her more than I do with some of my friends and family. Within a matter of moments, Gornick's voice can direct us from the vibrant world she moves through to the innermost chambers of her heart and her mind, and there in that union lies her stunning talent. Born and raised in the Bronx, Gornick began her writing career as a journalist at the Village Voice in the 1970s, where she covered, among other topics, the rise of feminist thought through her own conversion to the cause. Her 1987 memoir, Fierce Attachments, told the story of growing up under or alongside or eventually as her mother in New York, and is considered one of the finest examples of contemporary memoir. Its themes of living a life of the mind and transcending, quote, the daily infliction of social invisibility that women experience as outsiders were continued in 2015's The Odd Woman in the City, which the LA Review Books called a guidebook for how to exist. Overall, Gornick is the author of 14 books of memoir, essay, and criticism, and has been a finalist for the National Book Award, National Jewish Book Award, and National Book Critics Circle Award. Gornick's voice, the writer Michelle Orange has written, does not just tell the story, it is the story. It's for this reason that I'm so delighted to have her here tonight, to hear that splendid, powerful voice from its source. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Vivian Gornick. I'm not reading memoir or the personal essay. I'm going to read you from a book that I'm writing now, and that book is kind of a combination of criticism and memoir. I'm rereading books that I read as a young woman uh, and that meant a great deal to me. And I'm intertwining my own life in relation to the books. So I'm going to read you uh, the, the opening section of this. The uh, subtitle, I don't know what the title of the book is yet, but the subtitle is a line from uh, the great Italian writer Italo Calvino, in which he said, a classic is a book that has never finished saying what it has to say. 
And I'd like to think a life is also something that never finishes saying what, as long as we're alive, it never finishes saying what it has to say. So I took that as a, a, a liberty um, to use my own life uh, to, some, to some extent to talk about how the books change as the world changes and as I change and as the years pass. This first section is on Sons and Lovers. A formative experience of my life occurred the day I was then 20 years old and a student at the City College of New York. An English teacher put into my hands Sons and Lovers. I was a working class kid. There were few or no female protagonists in the books I read. And until then, I'd never heard the term coming of age novel. But I knew one when I saw one, and Paul Morell's emotional struggle to leave home put the matter so starkly and so dramatically that even at that tender age, I felt myself communing with the primitive conflict <coughs> at the heart of the tale. I read the book in one gulp, came back to class in trance, and from that day forward, Sons and Lovers was biblical text. It was as though I'd had a conversion experience. From here on in, I knew <coughs> It was literature with a capital L was to be my book of wisdom. It was to literature that I returned to understand what I was living through and what I was to make of it. I read Sons and Lovers three times within the next 15 years, and with each reading, I identified with another of the characters. The first time it was Miriam, the farmer's daughter with whom Paul loses his virginity. I got her immediately. She sleeps with him not because she wants to, but because she fears losing him. During, during intercourse, excuse me, her terror is such that instead of yielding to the experience, she lies beneath Paul, lost to his own sexual delirium, thinking, does he know it's me? Does he know it's me? Miriam's primary need is to know that she is desired and for herself alone. The dilemma was devastating. I felt the heat, the fear, the anxiety engulfing each of these two, but most especially, I felt it as though I was Miriam herself. I was 20 years old. I needed what she needed. The next time I read the book, I was Clara, the working class woman who was sexually passionate, wants to engage with erotic life, but still is alive to the potential for humiliation, hidden in her need to feel, again, that she too is desired, and again, for herself alone. Third time I read the book, I was in my early 30s, twice married, twice divorced, newly liberated. <laughs> and I identified with Paul himself. Now preoccupied with desiring rather than being desired, I gloried in giving myself up to the shocking pleasure of sexual experience itself, rich, full, transporting. At long last, I was the hero of my own life. Only, of course, I wasn't. My point here is only that for me, this particular rite of passage, the fraught discovery of the joy, the misery, the awe of making oneself vulnerable to passion, was permanently sealed into the continued rereading of a great novel that repeatedly seemed to mirror my own gathering development, at the same time that its influence as a work of art broadened and deepened, filling me with wonder again and again at the intimate connection between life and literature. The illusion of self-mastery that comes with ecstatic sex is just that, an illusion. But for however long, sex outside of marriage had been one of Western civilization's strongest prohibitions, that illusion retained power of an almost mythical order. When I was a girl in the 1950s, the culture was still joined at the hip to the restraints of bourgeois life, which only fed the dream of transcendence interwoven with the promise of self-discovery, wrapped around the astonishment of sexual passion. Except for one vital difference between then and now, then we didn't call it sex, we called it love. And the whole world believed in love. My mother, a communist and a romantic, said to me, you're a smart girl, make something of yourself, but always remember, love is the most important thing in a woman's life. <coughs> Across the street, Grace Levine's mother, a woman who lit candles on Friday night and was afraid of everything that moved, whispered to her daughter, don't do like I did, marry a man you love. Around the corner, Elaine Goldberg's mother slipped her arms into a Persian lamp coat and shrugged. 
It's just as easy to fall in love with a rich man as a poor man. <laughs> and her voice was bitter, precisely because she too believed in love. It was a working class immigrant neighborhood in the Bronx. Our lives might be small and frightened, but in the ideal life it was felt, the educated life, the brave life, the life out in the larger world, love would not only be pursued, it would be achieved. And once achieved, transform existence, create a rich, deep, textured prose out of the inarticulate reports of inner life we daily passed on to one another. The promise of love alone gave us the courage to dream of leaving these caution-ridden precincts in order to turn our faces outward toward genuine experience. In fact, it was only if we gave ourselves over to romantic passion, that is love, without stint and without contractual assurance, would we have experience. We knew this because we too had been reading Anna Karenina and Madame Bovary at the Age of Innocence all of our lives as well as the 10,000 middle-brow versions of those books and the dime store novels coming just behind them. In literature, good and great not writers, as well as mediocre popularizers, had sounded depths of emotion that made readers feel the life within themselves in the presence of words written to celebrate the powers of love. There might, of course, be a price to pay. One might be risking the shelter of respectability, even in the 1950s if one fell in love with the wrong person. And don't forget, Emma and Anna did end up in suicides. But no matter, the only truth for us was the power of feeling these heroic figures generated through their courage to risk all for passion. Like everyone else reading Sons and Lovers in the 20th century, and by everyone else, I mean the educated common reader, I experienced the book as an essence of this conviction that to know oneself through the senses was to arrive at the very heart of human existence. It's interesting to realize now that while we thought we were contemplating passion as an instrument of some higher plane of achieved life, we really were seeking it as a goal in itself. No one ever had a word to say about what happened afterwards. That's why when the movie ended with the lovers riding off into the sunset, we all walked out of the theater feeling vindicated. In another but related vein, upon rereading Sons and Lovers, I also found each time around that I'd gotten much in the book itself wrong. This was actually a common experience. It is to this day for me. Rereading this or that book that has been important to me throughout the years and repeatedly finding that a narrative I'd long thought memorized was being called into startling question. It would appear that I'd gotten this or that character or this or that plot turn wrong. They met here in New York. I was so sure it was Rome. The time was 1870. I thought it was 1900. The mother did what to the protagonist? And I could never help marveling. If I got this wrong and this and this wrong, how come the book still has me in its grip? When I came to reread Sons and Lovers recently, in shall we say my advanced maturity, <laughs> it wasn't so much that I found I'd gotten many of the details wrong, which I had, but rather that my memory of the edible theme of sexual passion as the central experience of the life was wrong. That I know so wasn't really what the book was about. And I found it all the greater and the more moving that I had held it close to my heart all these years for a set, not of misinformed, but insufficiently informed reasons. The psychological complexity of the novel, which had eluded me, now seemed only to have been waiting for me to grow into the understanding it required of its readers. Set at the turn of the 20th century in a mining village in the English Midlands, <coughs> Sons and Lovers tells the story of the Morels and their four children. <coughs> Gertrude, a school teacher of romantic sensibility, and Walter, a fun-loving miner, had met at a dance. She drawn by his good looks, his gaiety, his talent for dancing, while he in turn is attracted by her responsiveness to his sensuality. They develop a passion for each other and they marry. He promises her a house of her own, a good enough income, and tender fidelity. Soon enough, she discovers that on none of these can he deliver. <laughs> he had no grit, she said bitterly to herself. What he felt just at the minute, that was all to him. He could not abide by anything. There was nothing at the back of all his show. He, in turn, is startled to find that she cannot bear disappointment well. It turns her bitter and austere. In no time at all, he, bewildered by the constant sense of accusation he now feels at home, 
escapes to the pub every chance he gets. Eight years down the road, when the book begins, Mrs. Morell is 31 years old, pregnant with her third child, living in an undreamt of poverty, both material and emotional, and repelled by her husband, whom she and the children along with her now experience only as a heart-drinking, violent lout. As romantic sensibility does not desert Mrs. Morell, <clears throat> it is to her sons, the one daughter has no presence at all, <clears throat> that she inevitably turns for the kind of companionship required to feed a star in her life. At first it is William, the eldest, of whom she hopes to make a soulmate, but it soon transpires that it is Paul, the second son and our protagonist, with whom she had really been destined to merge. From the very beginning, when he is still an infant in her lap, quote, she felt strangely toward the infant. It seemed quite well, but she noticed the peculiar knitting of the baby's brows and the peculiar heaviness of its eyes, <clears throat> as if it were trying to understand something that was pain. Suddenly, looking at him, the heavy feeling at the mother's heart melted into passionate grief. Her soul's anxiety has entered into the babe. At the age of three or four, he cries for no reason, grows melancholy for no reason. But the reader understands. The reason is that from birth on, Paul and his mother have been as one. From that moment on, we know this is not exactly mother love at work here. These are the thoughts and feelings of a woman who sees her spiritual salvation joined to that of this boy who, enthralled to his mother's adoration, will as a teenager declare that he will never leave her, but as he grows to young manhood, ineluctably discovers that the life within is pulling him toward the kind of self-discovery that demands he leave her behind. And not only because she's his mother, but because she has not thought and felt the thoughts and feelings that would allow her to accompany him into a larger world. The metaphor Lawrence uses for Paul's wrenching dilemma is, of course, erotic love. As Paul's need for it grows and the two women, Miriam and Clara, become the instruments of his awakening and initiation, he delves ever deeper into its extraordinary force until he finds that passion has the ability to mimic liberation, but not actually deliver it. The struggle, not between Paul and his mother, but between Paul and the illusion of liberating sex, is the spine of the novel. It was this last that I had always failed to register. And the characters were far more complicated than I had remembered. In the very first pages of the book, while she's still pregnant with Paul, Lawrence writes of Mrs. Morell, she was sick of it, the struggle with poverty and ugliness and meanness. She went into the garden, feeling too heavy to take herself out, yet unable to stay indoors. And looking ahead, the prospect of her life made her feel as if she were buried alive. What have I to do with it, she said to herself. What have I to do with all this? Even the child I'm going to have, it doesn't seem as if I were taken into account. This was a speech I did not at all recall. It sounded more like a woman speaking in 1970 than in 1910. I had thought of Mrs. Morell as a rather one-dimensional person, a tight-lipped woman whose obsessive involvement with her own betrayed dreams of life has deprived her of perspective. But there she is, conscious of a self that, in the midst of the endless quotidian, she knows is missing. And right here begins the separating out of what I now saw was the larger piece of understanding that underlay Lawrence's insistence on the primacy of the sensual. Then there's Morell himself. I remembered, remembered him as a Caliban, but he's only a childish man whose gift, his only gift, for innocent sensuality has been steadily eroded by the lack of the very thing that could have made him a better person, sympathetic partnership. In his youth, he'd been a great dancer with a love of music embedded in, in a heart that yearned to be light. And even now, going off to work in the pit, in the mine, he tied a scarf around his neck, put on his great heavy boots, his coat with a big pocket that carried his snack bag and his bottle of tea, and went forth into the fresh morning air. He loved the early morning and the walk across the fields. So he appeared at the pit top, often with a stalk from the hedge between his teeth which he chewed all day long to keep his mouth moist, down the mine, feeling as happy as when he was in the field. That took me by surprise. He was a good workman, dexterous, and one who, when he was in a good humor, always sang. 
He had whole periods, months, almost years, of friction and nasty temper. Then sometimes he was jolly again. It was nice to see him run with a piece of red-hot iron into the scullery, crying, out of my road, out of my road. Then he hammered the soft red glowing stuff on his iron goose and made the shape he wanted, and the children watched with joy. Morel, too, has been left crying in the wilderness. His head is filled with chaos because he is a sentient creature who, unlike his wife, cannot say to himself, where am I in all this? It is precisely his inarticulateness that makes it hard for him to come straight home after work, which in turn leaves his wife, even though she now hates the sight of him, doubly trapped in the misery of normalcy outraged. They loathed him. They loathed him, Lawrence repeats, incredible number of times in this book. On page three, Mrs. Morell hates Morell. On page five, she holds him in contempt. On page eight, she loathes him. Then it starts all over again. And these repetitions go on for most of the novel. For a book devoted to love, the unremitting rage flung down on, the page, on page after page is sobering. Yes, they loathed him, but they also were him. Paul would rather scrape the skin off his body than admit to any shared characteristics. But, and this I certainly did not remember, he is actually as moody and thin-skinned as his father. At 14, he, quote, was full of life and warm. Then his smile came suddenly and was very lovable. But when there was any clog in his soul, his soul's quick running, his face went stupid and ugly. He was the sort of boy that becomes a clown and a lout as soon as he is not understood, or feels himself held cheap, and again is adorable at the first touch of warmth. Somewhere within himself, Paul must have known that all sensuous feeling in him, sorry, tender or murderous, ever ready to burst the skin, came from Morel. But if he had let himself think about it, it would have made him ill. So Lawrence doesn't make him think about it, but allows the reader to do so. And then there is William, William whom I had forgotten completely, William whose outcome is perhaps the most telling of all. William has the soul of an accountant, absorbed in his white collar job in London, which he expects will bring him money and a rise in social status. He quite cheerfully comes home less and less as children bent on making their way in the city do. But one Christmas, still in his early 20s, he brings home Lily, a secretary to whom he's engaged himself. She is beautiful and he is besotted with her at the same time that he seems permanently irritated by her because she is vain and stupid. And now that he sees her through his mother's eyes, gets horribly on his nerves. Torn apart by the conflict within himself, William quarrels with Lily at the drop of a hat and instantly regrets his bad behavior. Then lets his head fill once again with blood he repented, kissed and comforted the girl. But in the evening after supper, he stood in the hearth, on the hearth rug while she sat on the sofa, and he seemed to hate her. The mother goes into shock at what she sees happening to William. That's how she, it seems to her. It's happening to him, as in a Greek tragedy. She raked the fire. Her heart was heavy now as it had never been. She herself had been lured into marriage by sexual attraction. But this, this sort of desperation, the sort that comes with desire of being made conscious, no one of her generation had ever seen. She immediately recognized it as world shattering. As does William himself. His hunger for Lily is hateful to him. It humiliates him and, and drives him to act in ways that he himself holds in contempt. He knows that Lily is guilty of nothing more than being herself, Yet he cannot refrain from heaping blame on her for his own wretchedness. In a burst of despair, he can't control. He cries out to his horrified mother that should he die, Lily would forget him in a week. That's how shallow she is. Just to read the words on the page is to see the torment writ large on William's face. How could I have forgotten that? Passion, passion, passion. Hard, mean, racking neither sensual nor romantic, only boiling. Passion that is more like war than love, the rawness behind the longing for sexual ecstasy, the depth of its anguish, the fear of rumination, the consequence that can never be undone. This alone has been enough to persuade whole civilizations of the primacy of erotic need. 
It is a stark and unforgiving look we have here at the price sexual hunger exacts from a life being lived in near Victorian times. Inescapably, I found myself remembering all those mediocre novels about marriage being written at the same time by H.G. Wells, novels in which the same conflict is often at the heart of the narrative, a working class boy who wants to rise in the world, but meanwhile is perishing for want of a sexual life, and talks himself into marrying the first girl who seems willing to lie down with him. If only he will marry her. He inv invariably, the protagonist of these novels, feels dread at committing himself to such a marriage, but the dread loses out to the killing need. It's a situation Wells knows from the inside out. Any reader can understand what he's talking about, but his writing is not up to making us feel the anguish inherent in the situation. It is with Lawrence, whose few pages on William and Lily are penetrating, that it is brought to, to vibrant life. William is a figure much more like a Wells protagonist than he is like his brother Paul, but it is on his behalf that Lawrence makes us shudder because what he sees in him, he sees everywhere and in everyone. That's how a novelist builds a world. Luckily for the book, William dies not long after the, the night of Christmas visit and will be left to Paul to sort it all out. It's through him that Lawrence will investigate exactly how much devotion, either to the flesh or the spirit, is required to address what I now saw as the underlying co concern of Sons and Lovers, how to construct a self from the inside out. Poor Miriam, and again this I didn't remember at all, what a bum rap she gets in this book. She too craves a life that will turn on having herself. Miriam is 16 when she and Paul meet. Brown-eyed, black-curled, beautiful, um, inclined toward religion because, as it has been for millions of women before and after, it's the only text available that lifts her from the grubby claustrophobia of an existence whose horizons are right up against her face. Lawrence sees her situation plainly, but cannot afford to give her the sympathy that might make of her a more central character than he needs her to be. So he gives her to, to us as so. She was like such women as treasure religion inside them, breathe it in their nostrils, and see the whole of life as a mist thereof. She loved tremblingly and passionately when a tremendous sunset burned out the western sky or sat in her bedroom aloft alone when it snowed. That was life to her. For the rest, she drudged in the house, quivered in anguish from the vulgarity of those around her and from the common-sounding voice of the curate and her brothers who were brutal louts she hated her position as swine girl. She wanted to be considered. She wanted to learn. If she could read, the world would have a different face for her and a deepened respect. Her beauty seemed nothing to her. Even her soul was not enough. She must have something to reinforce her pride because she felt different from other people. This sense of difference in Miriam is for Lawrence a double-sided coin. Paul shrinks from the religiosity, but when he sees her in church, his soul stirred within him because she seemed something more wonderful, less human, something he could not get to. It's interesting and somewhat painful to see that this inchoateness in Miriam is treated with suspicion, while the same inchoateness in her brothers, these wild, hardworking farmhands, whom Miriam and her mother are constantly trying to civilize through scripture, is analyzed with equanimity. Although these boys resented also appeal to their deeper feelings, which their mother is constantly trying to voice on them, uh, they can't bear it. Ordinary folks seemed shallow to them, trivial and inconsiderable. They have the same odd, inverted pride uh, out of their very inarticulateness and their very isolation. And so they were painfully uncouth in the simplest social intercourse, suffering and yet insolent in their superior superiority just like Miriam. Then beneath, and here's Lawrence at his fullest, was the yearning for the soul intimacy to which they could not attain because they were too dumb, and he means mute, and every approach to close connection was blocked by their clumsy contempt of other people. They wanted genuine intimacy, but they could not get even normally near to anyone because they scorned to take the first steps. They scorned the triviality which forms common human intercourse. These were sentiments Lawrence held with alternating scorn and compassion throughout his life. 
sentiments he feared applied to himself as well as the people among whom he grew. Thus, for his own purpose, as a writer, he loved, hated, and exploited the Miriams, but could neither give nor deny them their due. Instead, he lets Paul Morell drive himself crazy over this dilemma uh, in which he loves her, hates her. It's a long paragraph, I'll, I'll forego it. This habit of Lawrence's, of making the characters suffer, two and three, even three reversals of judgment, goes back and forth, back and forth, a lover, a hater, a lover, a hater. Reversals of judgment in the space of a single paragraph is a vivid presence in Sons and Lovers. It not only signifies the instability of our moods, it nails the torment at the heart of any decision rooted in mixed emotions. It also became one of the literary moves most referred to when readers spoke of the new form he was creating in this novel. At last, Paul persuades Miriam to lie down with him. Possession, he tells her, is a great moment in life. All strong emotions are concentrated there. And of course, it's a disaster. They fuck for a week. Uh, <laughs> but after every episode, each one is left feeling alone alone and in despair. We don't know what she's feeling, but he had always, almost willfully, to act from the brute strength of his own feelings, and he could not do it often. There remained afterwards always the sense of failure and death. If he were really with her, he had to put aside himself and his desire. If he would have her, he had to put her aside. In a sense, Lawrence does for Miriam what Hardy, with infinitely more sympathy, does for Sue Brighthead brings her to complicated life and sacrifices her to a lover's demand that inevitably makes of her the instrument of his need, superficially fulfilled, essentially denied. You don't want to love, Paul raves at Miriam. Your eternal abnormal craving is to be loved. You absorb, absorb, as if you must fill yourself up with love because you're, you've got a shortage somewhere. Exactly what his mother thinks of Miriam. Our hearts don't bleed for Miriam, though, as they do for Sue Brighthead, because Lawrence doesn't love her as Hardy loves Sue. In fact, Lawrence doesn't love anybody. I finally came to realize, and now recall, that W.A. Jordan had once said of him, on the forces of hatred and aggression, he's a master. Of affection and human charity, he knows absolutely nothing. <laughs> and here, I'd like to digress a bit through Sue Brighthead, the female protagonist of Jude the Obscure, <clears throat> to make a point about living and rereading. Re my living and my rereading. When we first meet Sue, she's bent on becoming a new woman of the 1880s. She and Jude, a country cousin, come up to the city, meet up, and very quickly she becomes his mentor, instructing him that together they must struggle to live freely and honestly. He's delighted with this idea and has the inner strength to try hard to follow through. However, Sue turns out to be intellectually brave but emotionally frail. Her anxieties make her not only sexually dysfunctional, in the goodness of 400 of the most agonizing pages in English literature, oh. where she undergoes the worst experiences a woman then as now could have, Sue reverts to religious mania, goes half insane, and is persuaded that she must pay and pay and pay for having outraged the gods. The first time I met Sue, I liked and admired her immensely, but couldn't fathom the sexual frigidity, and was horrified by the manic regression into religiosity. The second time I encountered her, I was 10 years older, I had just had an illegal abortion, and to my own dismay, was experiencing an apprehension I found shocking. Somewhere deep inside, in a place I could not put a name to, I, secular to the bone, was experiencing something like fear of retribution. One day, while out walking, the words formed themselves in my head, for this you will be punished. I went upstairs, took Judy Obscure off my bookshelf, and turned to the sections on Sue's religious mania. It was then that, for the first time, I began to see what a primitive issue abortion is an act capable of inducing existential dread in the most unlikely of people. All this I could see and feel through Sue because Hardy's sympathy for her runs so deep. 
Lawrence's Miriam, on the other hand, never really becomes flesh and blood because he does not let us see and feel her as she might see and feel herself. Nevertheless, after this last reading, I realized I would never see Miriam the same again. And to Clara, working class feminist who's had enough education and experience so that she too feels herself to be different. Unlike Miriam, Clara is possessed of a haughty reserve that makes her seem mysterious and exciting. She really hates men. Nevertheless, she falls for Paul and she sleeps with him. With Clara, he finally knows the rapture of sex. With Clara, he and his partner are drowning together. It is here in bed with Clara that his separation from adolescence, he's 23, is completed. And the alarming complexity of life with all its shimmering instability begins to take hold of him. When at last, Paul and Clara lie down together, the love they make is not only rapturous, for then the earth moves. Quote, and after such an evening, they both were very still, having known the immensity of passion, childish and wondering, like Adam and Eve, when they lost their innocence <coughs> and realized the magnificence of the power which drove them out of the paradise and across the great night and the great day of humanity. To know the tremendous living flood which carried them always gave them rest within themselves. If so magnificent a power could overwhelm them, identify them altogether with itself, so that they knew they were only grains in the tremendous heave that lifted every grass blade to its little height and every tree and living thing, then why fret about themselves? They could let themselves be carried by life. There was a verification that they had had together. Nothing could nullify it. Nothing could take it away. Oh no? A mere few months and 10 pages later, <coughs> Clara, quote, Clara knew this held it to her, so she trusted altogether to the passion. It, however, had begun to fail her. They did not often, they did not often reach again the height of the times when they experienced the oceanic. Gradually, some mechanical efforts spoiled their loving, or often he seemed merely to be running on alone. Often they realized it had been a failure, not what they had wanted. One night, he left her, knowing that evening had only made a little split between them. Their loving grew more mechanical without the marvelous glamour. Within the year, they had parted. It's passages like these two that mark the modernity of the book. Modernity was pushing all writers to put on the page the entire truth of whatever it was the writer found festering in the human psyche. Not only sorrow and disorder, but sadism, alienation, and the brevity of passion. I now think that Lawrence saw this last by the time Sons and Lovers was published. He was then 27. But the insight alone could not stack up against the pressure of that other thing that he also saw, and that was to be his life's obsession. That to be deprived of experience of the senses, as bourgeois society demanded we be, was truly a sin against life. Lawrence didn't know any more than Hardy on this score, or H.G. Wells, or George Meredith for that matter, grown-up writers all. It was simply the heat and urgency with which he insisted on outing what they all knew but could not address directly that set him apart. He was like an abolitionist <coughs> among anti-slavery liberals who say, yes, slavery, slavery is terrible, but in time it will die out, be patient while the abolitionist says, fuck that, now or never, and goes to war. <laughs> it was this in Lawrence that F.R. Levis called being, quote, disturbed enough by life to come to greatness. And it was true. To feel badly but calmly about what is spiritually deforming is the mediocre norm. To rage against it is to become an instrument of revolutionary change. In literature, one does that by naming the crime against nature without pity or caution or euphemism renouncing in no uncertain terms as Auden had it, the laziness or fear which makes people prefer secondhand experience to the shock of looking and listening for themselves. Because Lawrence did nothing but look and listen for himself. Levis placed him in Anne's great tradition. Among those writers he thought endowed with marked moral intensity. The third time I read Sons and Lovers, I was now in the early 70s, I was in the midst of divorcing my second husband. All around me, friends, relatives, even neighbors felt free to cry at me. Why are you doing this? What is it you want? The answers in my own ears sounded lame. <coughs> Why had I left him? 
After all, I wasn't married to a man I didn't love. I wasn't being forced to choose between work and marriage. Our sex life was fine. But the times were encouraging me to look with clear eyes at what I was feeling driven to do. And somehow involving myself once again in the harrowing life of the Morels felt intimately related. I had married twice because when I was young, a woman alone was a woman stigmatized as unnatural, undesirable, un-everything. Yet each time around, I discovered that I shrank from being seen as one half of a couple. I actually flinched when addressed as Mrs. And while I liked my in-laws well enough, I was intensely bored with my family life. Worst of all, there were times when, during a cozy evening at home, alone with my husband, I felt buried alive. The simple heart of the matter was, I didn't want to be married. I turned the pages of Lawrence's great novel as though reading Braille, hoping to gain for myself the freedom from emotional blindness the book was urging on its readers. Within the five years following the publication of Sons and Lovers, Lawrence wrote his two acknowledged masterpieces, The Rainbow and Women in Love. He said when he started them that he would not again write the way he did of the Morels, graphically and with transparency. Now, now he would make what he felt dense with meaning, <clears throat> wild and large and mythic, and so he did. In these books, he certainly has got the crime of suppressed feeling down brilliantly. This is where <clears throat> his genius succeeds without parallel. But the part in him that wants to believe in the everlasting good of erotic freedom, there anyone can now feel him plunged in chaos, the writing in these novels in a fever, because he suspects that what he insists is true may not, in fact, be true. Lawrence was writing at the beginning of the Freudian century, living in a time that was just on the verge of putting center stage what he himself was grappling with. His metaphor, in fact, was to become the wedge that modernism used to pry open the uncharted territory of human consciousness. If Lawrence were alive today, this metaphor would not be available to him, because today all have had long experience of the sexual freedom once denied. And having discovered firsthand that the making of a self from the inside out is not to be achieved through the senses alone. In fact, it would turn out that not only does sexual ecstasy not deliver it to us to ourselves, one must have a self already in place to know what to do with it should it come. That insight, however, was 50 years down the road of cultural as well as personal change. Meanwhile, the uninformed longing of youth to forge a life whose worth emanated from the experience of a great passion whatever the outcome, whatever the cost, haunted the imagination of those of my generation who pined to live life on a grand scale. And no one pined more for it than high-minded literary young women for whom the ideal carried special weight. Thank you. writing at the same time as Lawrence, and uh, when we were girls, and one of my girls is right here, <laughs> one of my friends from City College, two, actually. Um, when we were girls, we adored Colette. We thought Colette, now Colette was, was tough in her own way, but Colette was really erotic freedom. Colette was really telling us who we were, and who we were going to be, and how it was going to be. Um, and again, same thing, only much bolder, passion no matter what the cost. Well, the thing is, today I read uh, Sons and Lovers, and it's, you see, I, I don't hardly see it as I saw it once, but it's a great novel. I read Colette today, not so great. I said to myself reading her, could I put this in the hands of another 23-year-old woman? The answer, it answered, the question answers itself immediately, no. Every young woman, who, everything Colette depended upon the lack of experience in all of us, 
we were not living free sexual lives in those years, and, uh, and she certainly wasn't. Well, she made it. She made herself free, uh, but at great, at great uh, bourgeois cost. And so, um, so she wrote hard, hard stuff, marvelous. She's a great writer, but the books are time bound. It doesn't feel. It can't. It can't. It doesn't speak to me. After that, I moved from Colette to Marguerite Duras, another writer who is also uh, has a very, a very peculiar relation to erotic passion, and that peculiarity served my purposes. She, in her, she's really a gutter snipe. <laughs> she, she really <clears throat> has the most. Um, existentially unacceptable uh, views of uh, life and love. But because she does, she takes us deeper, much deeper into the causes of all this confusion. And anyway, I, I really, I don't, really don't know what I'll do after that, but I'm, I'm, I'm just wandering. I'm wandering, really, right now. <laughs> yes? How do you decide how much memoir to bring into? Ah, good question. question. I, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I'm very wary of it, um, and I'm not sure I'm doing well <laughs> with it at all. <clears throat> I'm not sure even how this is really work in progress. I don't know how much of this will survive, and I don't. I'm I'm uh, very uneasy about it, to tell you the truth. Uh, what I'm doing is very fashionable now. Everybody's doing it. <laughs> Everybody's writing about you know themselves and the books. And, and that, I think, is due to, to the, the anxiety caused by technology and by the fear of, of, uh, of print going out of print. Um, but suddenly, everyone in the world seems to be wanting to read and reread and write about reading. Um, and many of these books fail because they're overstuffed with memoir that doesn't really do anything. So uh, I'm just going by instinct now. and. Um, in fact, reading it out loud was very good for me. I saw how boring parts of it. <laughs> I'm not going to read this again. <laughs> but it, it's a very tricky business. Knowing how to use memoirish elements in anything and how to control that, how to use it rather than be used by it or led astray or go on and on and lose the thread. Just keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as someone who's written multiple memoirs, how do you decide sort of when a story ends and when a book ends and when like what sort of source material? What kind of an answer you want to a question like that? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean how? I mean, what, what is it? Your I mean it seriously. What kind of an answer could I give you? For that. Um, I have no idea. Like, <laughs> you must have some idea. It's like, or I guess how, when you're writing and when you're working on um, a long piece of autobiographical work, how yeah. do you decide when to end it? And well, I try to keep track of the story I'm trying to tell. I'm not writing a transcript. I'm not just reciting uh, elements or events. I have an idea, if I'm lucky, I, and I have to be, I have an idea in my head. I have an idea that I'm trying to dramatize. It's, I'm, tr I'm trying to get at something. I'm using the memoir to say something that will be of interest not just to my sister-in-law and my, my nieces, <laughs> but to you. Um, and I have to use, look, that's what teaching yourself to write is all about. You t you're teaching yourself through the writing. It goes on and on and on to trust a developed judgment. That's all that writing programs, by the way, can do for you. Nobody can teach you to write. They can teach you how to read, teach you how to read your own stuff, teach you how to develop the judgment to know over and over and over again as you go on. Uh, it's the longest apprenticeship in the world um, how, how to know when a piece of writing is working, how to know when it's lost its way, how to know what am I talking about? I mean, I know people who've spent years on, on work then one day they pick it up and say, what the hell am I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else to say to you. Practice, practice. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I actually really love the balance between like close reading and then that personal narrative that you did. That was really powerful. Yeah. And I guess what I was curious about was when you were putting this project together and looking back on the books that you had kind of grown with, were there any memories or, or, or works that surprised you uh, when you were get, you know, getting, these, getting these memories to go with? with you mean of the books? Books? Yeah. Uh, surprise me in what way? Like, um, so in this, in this one you talk about um, uh, having just had uh, an abortion, an illegal abortion, um, and I was just wondering, like, it seems like that, is, that memory especially is so powerful with the passage you had just read. Were there any memories and passages that when you linked them up in the writing of this, of this uh, piece that you, you were surprised at the connections that were made? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. But I'm not putting them down. Yeah. <laughs> I don't put down anything I feel vulnerable to. And I recommend you don't either. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Right? Yeah. Um, I have two questions. One is, what was it that uh, you may have said that led you to do this project of going over these books? And the other is, what do you think is it about something like Lawrence in the writing that makes it available to all these different kinds of experiences and interpretations with it's multiple feeling. Readings. It's the depth of his feeling for the subject. As I said about H.G. E. Wells, who I love. I, I love reading Wells, but it's like, goes down like ice cream. I mean, it's, it, it, it doesn't demand anything of me, and it doesn't make me feel deeply. With Lawrence, you're in there threshing with him every second. And the, the books are incredibly demanding. And, and I meant it too, Matt, not being able really uh, to read um, Women in Love and The Rainbow. I, I reread The Rainbow, and it exhausted me. It just exhausted me. But he's deeply moving to me. I don't know why, really. And he's guilty of every, every writing sin in the world. I mean, he, the repetitions are laughable, just ridiculous. Uh, endless, endless repetitions and endless reversals of the self and within one paragraph. But, the, but, but what it is is the feeling is so strong and so overwhelming that every now and then there's a sentence of such wisdom, um, I forgave him everything. <laughs> I never wrote anything for money, so um, the only pub the only um, the only surprise that publishing the publishing life brought was with every book I thought it would change my life, and they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that actually that is something all writers suffer from. Everybody thinks publish the book and write. The lights will go, as one writer who always used to say to me, the lights are going on over the Atlantic <laughs> when this book is published. That was the only surprise, that you, you, you learn um, each, each in your own way to live with exactly what a writing life does for you and what it does not do for you. 
and everyone discovers that for themselves. But otherwise, no, there were no surprises. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Good night. <laughs> okay, thanks again one for coming. Don't forget there are books in the back. There's also uh, some reception drinks. Please stay for those. And um, don't forget our next reading in a few weeks here, uh, October 25th, faculty reading. Thanks again.